Exodus 32, 7 through 14. Psalm 106, 23. Joel 2, 7. Genesis 18, 20 through 32. Luke 10, 25 through 37. And Luke 12, 1 through 12. As I mentioned, today's message is interceding. And uh, there are various forms of interceding. We're going to cover one in particular mainly, and then I'm going to touch upon a second one that on how we can intercede. Interceding is to act or interpose in behalf of someone in difficulty or trouble, as by pleading or petitioning. Isn't that interesting? That's secular. That's not the biblical explanation. That's, that's a secular description. Here's the second one. To attempt to reconcile differences between two people or groups to mediate. To mediate. Now you guys heard me say earlier, in prayer, I use my own terms, and you guys know that those are called randyisms. And so the randyism number one is stand in the gap. Stand in the gap. Sometimes we need to stand in the gap for someone else. Sometimes we need to stand in the gap until they can stand on their own. Sometimes we need to hold them up until they can stand on their own. The other one you guys have heard me say before, we need to be the conduit. The conduit between God and them. See, if the conduit is broken, then there's no more connection. If the conduit is broken, there's no more connection. We have to be the conduit. If you love your loved ones enough, you'll be willing to stand in the gap and be the conduit for them. Amen. That's right. And in doing so, we want to make sure that we understand that interceding sometimes isn't easy. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it's even painful. You guys have heard me say before, sometimes it's costly. Costly financially. Costly physically. Have you ever stood in the gap for somebody else and could feel the physical pain? Yeah. It's real. It's real. Sometimes it's costly because it's your time. How precious is my time? Can we put a value on that? I don't think we can. Can we? Can we put a value on how much our time is spent in interceding for somebody else? I think it's priceless. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to stand in the gap? Are we willing to intercede? Uh, and, and, and Webster's description, are we going to interpose on behalf of someone in difficulty? Isn't that crazy? Are we going to interpose for somebody in trouble? The second explanation, are we going to try to reconcile between man and God? Oops, the other way, right? Between man and God, right? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to stand in that gap so you can reconcile God to man and man to God? Are you willing to do that today? We're going to talk about a few different times where this has happened in the Bible. That's amazing. Let's start with Exodus 32, 7 through 14. Listen to this story. You ready? And the Lord said to Moses, go, get down. Shoot, get away. That's what he was telling Moses. Go, get down, get away from me is what he was saying at that point. All right, listen. For your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed even to it. And said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Boy, how quickly his people forgot, wasn't it? You know, have you ever helped somebody and then they forget about it? Yes. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. I won't mention the man's name, but there was an individual that I've helped many times through the years. And when you stop helping them, then all of a sudden you're the goat. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. So he's talking to Moses here. He says, they turned on me already. They've turned away from me. They're making golden calves and worshiping idols already. The Egyptians have barely stopped breathing. And here we go. It says, 
and they, they sacrificed to it. And said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed, it is stiff-necked people. I love that. <laughs> stiff-necked. Have you ever ran into somebody that's stiff-necked? Yeah. Hey, talk to somebody about Jesus Christ that doesn't want to hear it. Yeah. They become pretty stiff-necked, don't they? Yeah. These are stiff-necked people, he said. All right, and we're going to go on. Wow, this is God talking to Moses here. He says, your people are stiff-necked. Right? And he goes on to say, um, now, now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them. And I will make of you a great nation. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord his God, and said this, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt? with great power and with a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians speak and say, he brought them out of the harm's way to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your first, the fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have spoken and I have given to you, your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord relented from the harm which he said he would do to his people. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the boldness of Moses to stand in front of God and say, God, you can't do this. You can't do this. These are your people. These are the people that you said you were going to multiply. You're going to wipe them out? Besides, if you do that, God, then the Egyptians win. Yeah. Right? Because the Egyptians said, we're going to destroy you. Well, they didn't destroy you. Us, you did. Yeah. God, what are you thinking? Okay. Have you ever thought that? Yeah. Now, I'd be afraid to say that to God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not as bold as Moses, I'll tell you that. But in doing so, have you ever thought that? God, what are you thinking? Because that's basically what Moses was saying. You can't do this, God. You can't. As if Moses was going to stop him, right? <laughs> yeah, okay, Moses, you're going to stop him. But listen, what he was doing at that moment was he was interceding for his people. He was standing in the gap for his people. Why? Because they couldn't stand on their own, like I said a moment ago. Listen, people tell me, oh, God's got his mindset. He's going to do all this. He's got your whole life plan for you every step of the way, and it's not going to change. I say that's a bunch of bunk. That's a bunch of bunk. Amen. Because God gives you a free will to make choices of your own. Yes. And when you make those choices, then God can adjust from your choices. But I'm telling you right now, God does have a plan for each and every one of you. Yeah. If I looked at all of you guys and did this, which I'm doing right now, believe it or not, I am. I'm looking at all of you guys, yeah. right? If I looked at all you guys and said this, God has a plan for you. Yeah. He does. Yeah. Now, we have a choice whether to walk in it or walk out of it. Yeah. And sometimes we kind of dash in and out, don't we? I can think throughout my life how many times I was dashing out instead of dashing in. But you know, God had his hand on me the whole time. Some of you guys know my life in my teenage years. It wasn't, it wasn't pretty. But God had his hand in it. I don't like to beat a dead horse, but two and a, half, a little less than two and a half years ago, four doctors said I was going to die. God says, oh, no, you're not. Oh, no, you're not. I'll never get, that, that, I'll, get never, I'll never get tired of sharing that. Never. And in doing so, he said, here, God, your descendants, remember your descendants? He's pleading with you. God, please, don't do this. And what does the, first, the last verse say? So the Lord relented from the harm which he had said he would do to his people. So, one of two things has happened here. Either God was lying to Moses in the first place, and he never was going to destroy his people. Do you believe that part? No. 
No. Or God changed his mind because of Moses. Do you believe that part? Yes. That's the right part. Listen, we can make a difference for others and stand in that gap. And God may spare them just because we're faithful and just because we, we show God that, hey, I am faithful and I trust in you, Lord. I trust in you. We can stand in that gap. We can stand in that gap. And we should stand in that gap. Listen to what Psalm 106.23 references back to that. It says, therefore he said that he would destroy them. Had not Moses his chosen one stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he destroy them. Moses changed God's mind. If Moses wouldn't have been so bold, and Moses would have said, okay, Lord, I'm going to go back and tell them what you said to me, he would have destroyed them. He would have destroyed them. But Moses boldly says, no, no, Lord, I'm going to stand up for my people. Listen, we need to stand up for our people. Amen. Our Calvary community people, we need to stand up for each other instead of destroy. For that Christian that you know is a Christian at work, you need to stand up for them when other people are making fun of them instead of joining in. Amen. Because it's easy to, jo to join in. Didn't have this note in my notes, but I, I think I've shared this story with you guys before. The head baseball coach, when I coached at Olivet, one of the most godly men I know, he wrote devotional books that were sports oriented. And I truly, I know, I don't even believe it, I know that the man gave away more than he sold. He was always giving out books. I shared before, and I know I shared this part, uh, we were at a fundraiser for me uh, in Youth for Christ to support the ministry. And Jeremiah on the silent auction was standing there, and every time somebody put on a, a money amount, Jeremiah would put one dollar more. Jeremiah, I think, was nine years old or eight years old. He wasn't very old, ten years old, somewhere there, somewhere between eight and ten. And every time somebody would write down an amount, he'd write one, one dollar more. And it came to be that they picked up the sheets on the silent auction, and a lady came up and signed, and he didn't get a chance to sign it. So I told Jeremiah, Jeremiah, we'll go to the live auction and get one from the live auction, because there's one in that, too. Personally signed by Dr. Elliot Johnson, by the way. In the live auction, it went like four times more. Well, I went from making six figures to making 21 by a year. I, I didn't have the money to buy it. That was on a Saturday night. On Sunday morning, the pastor of our church says, hey, I got somebody that I want you to meet. After church, he introduces me to somebody who's none other than Dr. Elliot Johnson. So I told him what happened the night before. And he says, wait a minute, he goes out to his car and gets seven different devotionals, seven different sports themed devotionals. He says, now which one does he like? I said, he loves the football one. He signs it personally to Jeremiah and hands him all seven of them. Coincidence? No, God What is it? Is it? Debbie, what God is it? God incident. God incident. It was a God incident, right? It wasn't a coincidence. It just so happens to be at that same time I'll finish the story that the Sunday school superintendent said, hey, Randy, the new baseball coach needs an assistant, and I recommended you. And I laughed at him. And on Monday, the head baseball coach's son started at Limestone Books, Cornerstone Books, with Donna, both of them their first day at that job. And they were talking, and Donna started laughing because she told him, hey, my husband's going to meet with your, your dad tomorrow. On Tuesday, as I walked in Alabama's hallway, the sports coach's hallway, walked down the hallway, get to the baseball coach's door, knocked on the door, his back was to me. He says, come on in. As he turned around, who was it? Dr. Elliot Johnson. Is that a coincidence? No. Nope. nope. That's how I started coaching at Alabama. Listen, I stopped playing high school baseball as a sophomore. Should I have been coaching at Alabama? There's no way, except for one reason, God. Now we had this young man, I won't tell you his whole name, but his first name was Aaron. And Aaron had a tough life. Aaron uh, grew up single mom. Mom had boyfriends in and out of the house, rough living. Sometimes mom got beat up. I think sometimes Aaron even got beat up. Had tough living. 
Aaron's going to Central Michigan University, a small Division I school, and he's the starting center fielder at Central Michigan. Aaron gets his girlfriend pregnant. He quits school to be the right man and go take care of his girlfriend and the baby. And the girlfriend decides to have an abortion. He tries to go back to Central Michigan. They said, sorry, we already filled your scholarship. You left the team. Out of all the schools in the country, how in the world does he end up at Olivet Nazarene University? He does. A little story about Aaron. At the beginning of the year, Aaron would pop up, and as he's running to first base, he'd be mumbling with swear words, right? And he'd mumble under his breath, and it drove Elliot nuts. It drove Elliot nuts. No, Elliot wanted to kick him off the team. I said, no. No, Elliot, you can't. He came here for a reason. He said, out of bed, out of all the schools possible, he came here for a reason. Halfway through the season, him and Elliot got in an argument. Elliot wanted to kick him off the team. I said, no, Elliot, you can't. He came here for a reason. A third time during the season, they had a confrontation because Elliot didn't like some of the things Aaron was doing. It wasn't directly at Elliot. And I said again, no, Elliot, you can't. He's here for a reason. Elliot said to me, he says, why do you stand up for this kid so much? I said, because when I was 19 years old, I was that boy. I was the boy playing in church, uh, not church league softball too, but uh, open softball, popping up and mumbling swear words going to first base. That was me. I said, I think I turned out okay. And then I said, no, you turned out better than okay. I said, I gave Aaron a chance. Unfortunately, that season I quit coaching and Elliot cut his scholarship, which I was so disappointed in that. Because Elliot really is a godly man. And I, I just thought, man, why'd you cut his scholarship? So now listen to me. Out of all the places, out of all the places Aaron could go, he ends up at Missouri Baptist University. It's like, how in the world does Aaron end up at Missouri Baptist University? He ends up, he was carrying, barely carrying C's and D's at all of that. His senior year at Missouri Baptist, he's an academic All-American. Not only was he an academic All-American, he was the conference player of the year in their conference. See, Aaron was searching. Aaron was searching, but he needed somebody to stand in the gap until he found it. You guys get that? Yeah. I mean, from the bottom of my heart, that's what he's saying. Joel 2.17 says this, Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach, that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? That's kind of a mouthful. Let me break that down real quick. What he's saying there is that as pastors, as priests, as clergymen, we need to stand in the gap and we need to stand up for God in the community. Because if we don't do it, who's going to do it? Amen. If his godly people won't do it, then our God is not going to do it. That's for sure. And he says here, he says, hey, they need to break down and cry. They need to break down and cry. Weep, it says. There's a difference between crying and weeping. Crying is wiping away a tear. Yes. Weeping is when your insides hurt. Yes. Have you ever done that? Yes. Have you ever weeped where your insides have hurt? Yes. That's what he's calling. That's what he's calling us as church leaders to do. Steve, you are to weep over your people. Pastor Randy is to weep over your people. I want you to know that I have wept over you guys before. I have where your insides just ache because you want something so bad for your people. He says they should weep over it. And he says further that, he says, but God, here's the reason why. And so those people that are out there clowning around can't make fun of you and your people. That's what he's saying. Well, maybe he didn't say clowning around. <laughs> but you guys get the picture, right? He said, God, you can't let this happen. 
going back to what Moses did, right? Say, God, don't allow this to happen. Don't destroy your people. Here's another time where somebody stood in the gap boldly. Says, God, you can't do this. You can't do this. Because what happens is Satan and his disciples win, Lord, if you wipe out your, your people. As filthy and as nasty as we are, we're still his people. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. I think Paul, who was one of the greatest ones in all the Bible, said what? You filthy as rags? Did he say that? Yeah. Right? Yeah. We're as filthy as rags. But we're his. We're his. And because we are his, guess what? He's not going to destroy us. He's not going to destroy us. He may destroy them. But he's not going to destroy us. Genesis 18, 20 through 32 says this. And the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very great, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Then the men turned away from there and, and went towards Sodom. But Abraham, Abraham had... Who knows what he was thinking? But Abraham, instead of going away, came near to the Lord. And it says here, and Abraham came near. And said, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? <laughs> Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, Lord, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Well, pretty bold, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay, God, aren't you going to do the right thing? Is what he's saying. So the Lord said, if I find inside of 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place of their saves, for their saves. Then Abraham answered and said, Indeed now, I who am but dust and ashes have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than 50 righteous. Would you destroy all the city for a lack of five? So he said, if I find there 45, I will not destroy it. And he spoke to him yet again and said, suppose there should be 40 found. You get it, right? There. <laughs> and he, so he said, I will not do it for the sake of 40. Then he said, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose 30 should be found there. So he said, I will not do it if I can find 30 there. And he said, Indeed, now, I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 should be found there. So he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. Then he said, Let not the Lord be angry with me, and I will speak. But once more, suppose 10. Suppose 10 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. You know what the sad thing is? There weren't even ten. Oh. And God destroyed it anyway. And all the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and all the city of Bradley and Bourbonnet together. Oh. Lord, and Bradley and Bourbonnet together, if you could find 50 godly people, would you spare it? Mm -hmm. Lord, and Bradley and Bourbonnet together, if you could find five less, would you spare it? Lord, 30? Lord, if we can find 30 righteous people in Bradley and Bernay, would you spare it? Oh, Lord, sorry, but I'm going to ask you again. How about 20? I mean, we've gone this far. We might as well go a little farther, right? Now, Lord, don't get angry with me. But can we find 10? Can we find 10 in all of Bradley and Bernay? Can we find 10 in Sodom and Gomorrah? Or even ten. Or even ten. You know what the amazing part is? Abraham gave Lot his choice. He could have stayed in the mountainside or he could go down in the in the valley where there was rich and plenty. 
Of course, Matt picked the richest one because money may cost him his life. Think about that. Sometimes that old mountainside isn't so bad after all, is it? Sometimes struggling on the mountainside isn't so bad. Sometimes that valley looks prettier than what it is. It can be dangerous. So he says here, how about 10? And we know the final story, right? He couldn't find 10, so he destroyed it. And then we go on a little bit further. Lot's daughters who were drunk decided to lay down with their father. How shameful. You know, they didn't just see the whole city destroyed. They didn't just see their wife, their mom turned into salt because her heart was so en entrenched in Sodom and Gomorrah that she just, and God told them, don't look back, don't look back. But her heart was in Sodom and Gomorrah. So what did she do? She turned back. And when she turned back, God said, bang, I'm going to turn you into a pillar of salt. And that's exactly what he did. Think about that. Don't look back to your old ways is what he was saying. Don't look back to that filthy grime of your old life is what he was saying. And sometimes we do that, don't we? Sometimes we turn back to our old filthy lives. And God's saying, don't look back. Keep going forward. Keep moving forward. But again, here's Abraham bold enough to stand in front of God and say, you know what, I'm going to stand up for these people. See, we talk about moments. When we talk about moments, I just talked about Bradley and Bourbon A. We can't find 10 of Bradley and Bourbon A. I hope Don and I are two of the 10. <laughs> right? <laughs> but in doing so, we talk about moments. What are we doing? What are we doing? Think about that. Think about that, especially those of you that live in moments. Think about that a little harder. What are we doing here? It's a beautiful church. It's a beautiful Sunday morning. And we're cautious. Is that such a word? It is now. That's a rainy other. <laughs> we just made one, right? But in doing so, what are we doing? Are we playing church? But we want to become bold like Joel and Abraham and Moses. I don't know about you guys, but I'd like to come at least a little bolder. A little bolder. Maybe not question God like that, but a little bolder, right? Luke 10, 25 through 37 says this. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Pretty simple, right? Not always. With all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly, do this and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. How shameful. He passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. And it goes on to say, so he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was the neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, 
He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. You need to be that Samaritan. Now keep in mind, remember, Levites and Samaritans didn't like each other. Levites and, Amer and the Samaritans didn't like each other. And yet here's this man who's the Samaritan man that reaches down and helps the Levite while the priest and the other man passes by on the other side. Which one are you today? Which one are you today? Are you the Samaritan man? Or are you one of the two Levites? Are you the one that stomps your feet and hills, I'm a child of God? Because we talked about that last week and the week before, right? And yet you walk by somebody that needs help. Which one are you? Are you a true child of God that will stop and help? Are you a man or a woman that proclaims you're a child of God and in reality you're going to pass him by? I hate to say this, but there are too many men and women in the pulpit today that are just like that priest in the Bible. Amen. There are too many people that are upholding the podium today that are just like that priest in the Bible. Heaven forbid I never become that person. And if I do, somebody please slap me. Hard. Okay. <laughs> I'll remember that, Pat. <laughs> I'm not looking forward to it, but I'll remember that. I'm serious. I'm that serious. You guys have heard me say before, the day I stopped preaching the word, the day I stopped preaching the truth, kick me out. Kick me out. Kick me out as fast as you can. Because I'm going to preach the word. I'm going to preach the truth. The Lord tells me no more. Amen. And that's the way it's going to be. Sometimes I know I hurt feelings and sometimes I hurt toes. But if your toes are hurting, that means that God is talking to you. Maybe we should hurt toes a little more. So as we look at this, we've seen a couple of different examples. We've seen the, the example of standing in the gap for your people. We've seen the example of standing in the gap by helping others. And I'm going to finish with this one. Luke 2, 1 through 12. It says here, and again, he entered Capernaum after some days. And it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, now listen to this. This is amazing to me. This is so cool. I love this story. As, he, as they approached the house, they couldn't get close to him. And they brought the paralytic, the four men, and one each carrying each corner of the, the stretcher. And they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, when Jesus saw their faith, did you hear that? When Jesus, it didn't say when they, he saw the faith of the paralytic. Right. He said that, it says here, that when he saw their faith, the four men interceding for that one man that was a paralytic. That's what was going on right here. And he saw their faith. And he says here, as he saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Boy, that sounds familiar sometimes too. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, dummy. <laughs> but immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, Arise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, let me stop right there, because he also told us that when he left, he gave us that same power. You hear me? He's given us this same power. And he says here, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all. So that all, how many? All. All were amazed and glorifying God. 
saying, we never saw anything like this before. Man, it gives me God folks. I want to just shout. <laughs> Woo! I'll shout. <laughs> Nobody else wants to shout, I will. <laughs> Praise God. And he says this, and listen to me. It wasn't just like, you know, our roof was pretty easy. You tear back the, the tiles, the shingles, there's some overlayment, and there's some wood. That's pretty easy to get through. We're talking about thatch. Have you guys ever seen thatch before? Thatch is like dry mud with sticks and stones mixed in it, interweaved and bound together and dried out. And then as it's, it dries, it dries on the roof. So the pillars that are helping holding it in place, now the thatch is stuck to the wood that's holding it in place. That's what thatch is. And that's what that roof was made out of. So I can only imagine as they're tearing through this thatch that they're tearing their hands up. Eric, you're a carpenter. You tore up your fingers once or twice, haven't you? Quite a few, Quite a few times. It doesn't feel good, does it? Angelo's shaking his head. I know Steve. Think about that. Tearing their hands up trying to tear through this thatch. And it's not thin. It was thick. And finally they get through. And isn't that amazing that they dug right where Jesus was? And they're able to drop him down right in front of Jesus. Yeah. And listen, he wasn't saved yet. The Bible says this. He says that the four men's faith yeah. was all Christ needed to see. Because the paralytic wasn't saved yet. See, sometimes we need to stand in the gap yeah. for our loved ones. Sometimes we need to stand in the gap for our friends and our co-workers and our neighbors. Remember how this started? Who is my neighbor? Isn't that what he said? Who is my neighbor, Lord? Trying to test Christ. Wasn't very smart, but he tried. And Christ says, you know what? Here's your neighbor. Here's your neighbor. Here's your neighbor. Who is your neighbor today? But here's, I just got a couple words that I want to finish with. Listen to me, church. It cannot be a one-time thing. It cannot be a one-time thing. It has to become part of your fiber. Yeah. Part of who you are. Yeah. That's why I've said so many times, hey, if somebody comes through that door and they scam us out of a hundred bucks, shame on them. They're the ones that's got to pay the price to the Lord. Yeah. But if they use it properly and we give it to them, then we both get blessed. Yeah. If we turn them away and they did need it, shame on us. That's on us. Yeah. That's right. Now, he does give us discernment, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. I shared a couple weeks ago about when Daryl had a check in hand going to that one house. And he could hear the people inside the house. And as Daryl knocked, they didn't answer the door. You know why? Because God sealed that door so we wouldn't give that, those people that check. That's why. Daryl brought the check back. I said, what are you doing with the check? <laughs> right? Daryl brought the check back. Why? Because God sealed that door. Listen to me. If we make a mistake because we're leaning and, and, and working on the side of God, I think God can forgive us. If we make a mistake because we're trying to do what's right by God, I think God will see through it. Don't you? Think about that. Think about that. It's got to be in our soul. It's got to be in our spirit. It's got to be who we are as a church, Calvary Community Church. I keep saying, I tell people all the time, I personally believe, this is Randy, this is Randyism again, I personally believe this, that Calvary Community Church and the Town of Moments is a house of refuge. I believe that. I believe that this little church is a house of refuge. But you know what? I don't think we've proclaimed it enough. We need to proclaim it more. We need to open those doors to those people that are hurting. I don't even know who the guy is. There's a guy on a bicycle. He wears a uh, vest that's a uh, reflector vest so he doesn't get ran over. Huh? Dennis. You know who Dennis is, don't you, Barbie? <laughs> Guys, that guy, I don't even know who he is. He's been put on my heart that someday he's going to walk through these doors. And I might be wrong, but I think Dennis goes to the to the bar like every day. I believe that's where he's attending. And I don't mean to put the man down. 
But what I'm saying this is that I have envisioned that someday he'll ride that bicycle right past there and right to here. I told you guys before, I don't know why, the Lord has put it on my heart. We got a four-way stop sign two blocks ahead. And people will start going past that four-way stop sign and coming here, not even realizing why they're coming. They're coming to meet the Lord. Because we have a house of refuge. People can come and be healed. That should be our fiber. That should be in our souls. That should be who we are. And if it's not, then we need to work towards it. And you know what? I know for a fact that everybody that I know that's come through those doors has felt welcome. Amen. Because we are a family. We are one. Family squabbles sometimes, don't they? But we're still a family. Sometimes with, with the five brothers of mine, I want them to not fall in the head. <laughs> right? But you know what? <laughs> I want to. I want to play. Lord, you know I was crazy. But I want to finish with this. I want to finish with this. There were so many times where me and one of my brothers would be getting in a squabble, right? Of course, one of the neighbor kids would try to break it up. But you know what ended up happening? You got it. <laughs> the two of us turned on the other guy, right? Because we're brothers. Is that crazy or what? But you know what? If we took on that same attitude towards the Lord. Sometimes we don't get along with each other. Sometimes we don't fit. Sometimes, you know, there's things that go wrong. But they'll go on and if somebody tried to turn on one of us, the other one should be right by their side, ready to bounce. I really believe that the Lord wants us to be that way. I really do. Remember, Christ interceded for us. Remember, I said earlier, sometimes it costs you. It cost him his life. Cost him his life for you and I. Are you willing to be that person? Are you willing to be that person? Are you willing? When we go to prayer, we're going to go into our last song before communion. I know we've ran a little long. You have to leave. I, I understand. I appreciate the you guys just took with me as the long as you got. But let's go in prayer and then I uh, will do a, a final song in the communion. And then we'll go to communion. All right. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again, we just praise you and thank you, Lord, for your love. Lord, that you are a lover, that a God so loving that you would forgive us, that you would hear us out as Moses and Abraham and Joel and others stood in the gap boldly. Lord, will you give us some of that boldness? Not in defiance. Not in defiance, Lord, but in love. There's a difference. It's easy to be defiant. Sometimes it's not so easy to love. Lord, you know even in my own heart this week I've struggled with that. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me that I wouldn't be a person of defiance, but a person of love. That this church body would be people of love. We ask all of this in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen.